This session has the title, The Facts of Live, Poo, Pee and Water. So that's a sort of standout session. But there was a short email conversation a few weeks ago, once the panel was in place, where we discussed what we call this session. I think it had various titles. Um, my colleague at CMU wanted to call it Talking Shit, but... Um, <laughs> But that wouldn't be the complete uh, topic that we're here to talk about today. So yeah, I should introduce myself. My name is Chris. I'm Chris Cook from CMU. So CMU is a service provider to the music industry. So we write about, talk about, and teach about the business of music. So I speak at lots of conferences around the world, moderate lots of panels around the world. We have our own conference as part of The Great Escape, which takes place in Brighton each May. But uh, this is one of my favorite conferences to come to, because usually, because I write about the music business and I speak at so many conferences, when I do panels, whatever the topic is, usually I know quite a lot about what the people are talking about. So if we're doing a streaming panel or a social media panel or a copyright panel, I know most of the answers that are going to come up, because I, I talk and write and spend a lot of time in those areas. What I love about this event is I know nothing. So I, I come here and every time I learn, and then I trade off this event for the next year, I will be <laughs> repeating the anecdotes and stories from these panels as if I am an expert on how to make events sustainable and more environmentally friendly. Um, so yes, th this session is, is looking at the challenges around getting uh, water onto site when you're putting on festivals and events, and perhaps even, well, that's quite tricky, but perhaps even trickier is then how to get what's done with that water off-site or maybe not taking it off-site and dealing with it there and then. So that's what our experts are here to talk about. So I'm going to get each of our panellists to quickly introduce themselves. Um, and then Virginia here has got a quick presentation that she's going to talk through. And then we'll, I've got lots of questions to then ask the panellists. And we might have five minutes at the end for you guys to ask questions too. So it is worth thinking of questions with this one, although we do have to finish at 3.15, so we are on quite a deadline. But uh, well, let's start at the far end and get each person to introduce themselves, just your name and what it is that you do, and then Virginia can do her quick presentation. Cool. Hi. Does this work? Hello. Ah, it's lovely. Um, I'm Graham McVoy. I work with GMC Events. Um, we've been involved in the events industry for about 20 years. Uh, about 1997, I did my first event, which was uh, in the Alps as a snowboard event. I lived out there for about 10 years or so, and uh, you can see quite directly the effect that climate change has when you're living in, in a sort of more extreme environment. And uh, after 10 years of living there and working there, it, it was significant. And, and when we moved back to the UK, um, obviously not so much snow here, so I, I started to focus my energies into, into music festivals. And, and you know, for the last 10, 12, or 13 or so years, that's what we've been doing um, with, a, with a big focus on site management. And uh, we've been involved in a lot of really great shows, some lots of independent ones, some corporate ones, and lots of uh, uh, lots of different demographics and crowds. So, I had a really good experience of, of delivering really different levels of of, of service uh, um, and objectives as well from from different promoters. Um, some of the stuff that we've been involved in is a uh, festival and the the Pipe Park concerts, part of the Card British Summertime. Um, now involved with Boomtown. And Shambhala is a big part of what I do now as well, and standing calling. So we've we've had a real sort of change in and and different styles of inner city and camping and and big scale and small scale. So it, I found it really interesting in the different ways everybody's uh, wants to deliver their shows. So hi, I'm Adrian Mills um, for uh, Water Mills. Um, I'm managing director of Water Mills. Um, originally, I started dealing with water on the ground plumbing so I'm, my background is right from a man and boy plumbing um, and um, I then would sort of grown into loving the water rather than the actual plumbing and the pipes <laughs> um, so we're, I, got it, it's, uh, I was a contingency planner for the UK um, water industry um, so I set up uh, what you've now seen, some of you have seen on the television just recently, which is all of the water supply in bottled water and everything else being sent out to Thames. By the way, we're absolutely crazy manic and the phones aren't just off the hook at the moment, but um, so I'm glad I'm here. <laughs> <coughs> um, so yeah, so I set out, set out um, a, a, a system of cleaning and preparing vessels. Um, which then we can use and put drinking water in, so it could be then used for the public consumption, because nobody wants to drink out of a dirty, bu dirty bucket. Um, so uh, then 
So I was a founder of Water Direct. Then uh, in 2005, Water Mills was established, and we focused on festivals and events, and some construction ins installations. So that's what we focused on. And then we, with the Graham mentioned a number of the, the uh, festivals that we're involved in. Um, some have been under also the Olympics. I was the water quality consultant, so to speak, of, for the build of the Olympics. Uh, for the whole of it. So, yeah, uh, I've also written and helped write a couple of standards, British standard, and there's one particular one called the British Standard 8551, which is the guidelines on how to deliver drinking water to the public. So, enough about me, uh, move on. <laughs> um, um, I'm Jane Healy, um, I'm the sanitation manager for Glastonbury Festival. Um, I have the amazing task of looking over five th looking after over 5,000 toilets. Um, thankfully, I love toilets, and I'm not just saying that. Um, <laughs> when I first started there, there were still polygons at Glastonbury, and I decided <coughs> to see if we could change that to compost toilets. It took a while in some ways. You know, there were obviously hurdles when you make changes. There's, you know, le you, know you have to learn on the job in a way, but we did it and it was the first time we had over a thousand compost toilets at one event, which was a first within the country. Um, at Glastonbury, I also get a chance to work with WaterAid, something I'm very passionate about, because I feel that as much as events, you know, it's great what we do, you know, but it can be slightly hedonistic. It's nice to also mix it in with something that's, you know, has a bit more depth and meaning, such as the work with, uh, with WaterAid. So with them, not only did I get to go to India and see what the money does that is raised, but I also got to meet um, people in India who deal with over 40,000 toilets. So I think my job's hard. <laughs> <Go on. laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm Virginia Gardner, and I am the founder CEO of a uh, waterless sanitation company um, called Luat. And I brought a few slides, which I can just start yeah. right in on, I guess. Um, but what I want to do with these is, um, is also use them to talk about um, what we are all here to talk about in the sense that um, water and sanitation are global challenges. And the events industry provides, I think, a really exciting place to innovate in this space. <coughs> um, so just a couple headlines. About 30% of people today have access to sewered toilets, which means 70% of people don't. Um, so most people don't have flush toilets, and I think that's something that comes as a surprise to some people, maybe not very many in this room. Um, and also the way that water scarcity is increasing globally means that this is going to be, this is a problem that's affecting everywhere in the world. So I think it's by 2025, about 66% of people in the world are going to be living in water scarce areas. Um, and that's very soon, and that's most of the world. So, um, so what, what we've done is um, we've tried to, uh, have an impact in this space, and we're working very hard now to have an impact in this space. Um, and our core belief is that um, everyone everywhere has the same standard for having um, a really nice, clean toilet. Um, and what's driving us and motivating us as a business is, is the ability to innovate for sanitation in urban areas that don't have sanitation at all. So we have projects now in Madagascar and the Philippines um, and looking to expand into other parts of the world, serving household people with waterless uh, flush toilets that are also linked to value generating infrastructure. So same core technology serving global markets. Um, so what we do is we have a toilet which packages and contains waste and biodegradable polymer film. The film and waste are then treated in value generating infrastructure. And the way that we work in the United Kingdom and now in the Philippines and in Madagascar and the way that we're hoping to try to expand, which I think is also really important. Uh, to talk about is that we're working with utilities who are providing uh, waste treatment in partnership with us. So there's this thing called the sanitation value chain that we also talk about when we talk about toilets, because everybody thinks that you use the toilet, you flush it, or you do whatever, and then you, you know, never have to worry about it again. But you haven't really addressed the problem at all unless you address um, the entire cycle of waste treatment. And so, um, so that's what we're doing, but in order to scale up more quickly, we want to do that in partnership with utilities, which in emerging markets are beginning to look more and more at um, human waste as just another organic waste that they have to deal with. Um, so waste separation and all this kind of innovative approach to waste 
that we talk about in events is actually happening in many parts of the world. And just as an illustration, in a lot of parts of Africa, the urban utility that handles um, sewage is not the water utility, it's the waste utility. So it's just a kind of different way of looking at things. So I'm going to go quick because I don't want to take up too much time. But key things which I think are important for all of us in this room as well, um, in a way, is uh, we believe that uh, customers have to love what's happening to make it really take off. So customer satisfaction is very important for us. Um, managing our waste is very important for us. Um, that's true for everybody here, so we keep talking about that. And also, ha uh, we believe that you know, government and utility, we have to, have to buy in to have this be something that will really change the world. So yeah, we've got toilets for events in the UK. So um, you know, we've, we've got a small operation that we have been growing um, gradually and also hoping to really reach the point where um, people who are stuck right now with chemical research toilets might say, hey, I want to have Luat toilets instead because they're actually nicer to service as well. Um, and then these are some of our toilets in Madagascar. Um, in Madagascar, we've also built um, an entire end-to-end -end treatment system. So we have experience building anaerobic digestion treatment as well. And here in the UK, we process waste with Thames water, and we're starting to partner with other utilities um, where they have actually a 80% now, and it's going to be 100% by 2020, of all the fecal sludge that Thames water is collecting is going into anaerobic digestion. Um, and that's a trend which is happening in other parts of the UK as well. So um, what's interesting about our technology approach for um, the UK is that we're actually really focusing as much on waste to value, we're <coughs> focusing on reduction of carbon emissions from liquid transport. So liquid transport is also a theme that I think we all have experience with. So I'll leave it at that um, so we can continue. So really interesting already, um, the various topics coming up there. And I think that's a very interesting point, which we will come back to towards the end of the conversation, is how what we're talking about here is how we deal with getting water in and getting waste away on a sort of short-term basis in our temporary festival or event sites. But what are the learnings that come from that that can be adopted on a much bigger scale and address bigger problems around the world? Um, and so, you know, as, as we explore new technologies and, and new approaches, how can we share that information and use that to, to, to address those significant issues and those significant stats that, that you opened with there. Um, so we will sort of, I think, probably come back to that at the end of the conversation. But I'm sort of interested in, as, as a starting point of, for those people in the room who, who are not actively involved at events on this side of getting the water in and getting the waste away, what are, I suppose, the, the, the basic expectations, the basic requirements of a major festival, temporary event, both in terms of getting water in and waste away. Um, and what would you say beyond the basic requirements, what are best practice? What is it that festivals and event organisers should be attempting to do to go beyond what are the basic requirements? So I guess, I mean, Adrian, you mentioned some of the standards that you've walked on in terms of water provision. So, I mean, why don't you perhaps kick off by saying, if I'm setting up a festival, what are the absolutes that I just have to achieve? And what would you be encouraging promoters and event organisers to do to go further? I don't know if you want to take, it might take that mic, that might. That one? Yeah. Is it on? Hello. Oh. Did it work? Did that work? <laughs> that might do. That, that might work. Yeah, there we go. It sounds like it's working. Yeah. If that works. No. Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah, let's swap. There you go. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, well, there's a, a one real basic, and that's containment. You know, nobody wants water flowing all over the place if you're going to drink it, and certainly you don't want sewage all over the place. So the first basic is, is uh, containment, and I think the second one has to be public health. You know, we, we, it, it doesn't take a rock, it's not rocket science. But how you achieve that is a different matter altogether. And then you've talked about logistics. Logistics are extremely important. That's planning, organising, because you've got different vari variables. You don't know exactly how much, who's going to use what. This is not an exact science. And I suppose, when, uh, are we on now here? Can you hear me? Yeah. I'll just yes. project. Um, <laughs> when you say uh, containment, is, is that, so the assumption is there, isn't, there aren't those pipes you were talking about earlier. We don't have pipes on site, so we're having to bring water in off site. So where are we going to store it and how are we going to store well, it? Well, that's exactly that. Yeah. So basically, you've got to think about the amount of the demographic 
Um, you know, if you've got uh, um, uh, a family event, they're going to use a lot more water than if you have uh, an absolute, you know, crazy rave. Um, but nevertheless, you still have to contain enough water in order to distribute it around the pipelines, etc. So you have to evaluate how much water is going to be used, and then how much storage you're going to be requiring, and then what's the consumption. So that's that's one simple factor as far as you know, just doing that calculation. So we do for the first three months of the year always planning for. What was, whether the event's going to be increasing, what the de demographics are going to be, um, um, and then how best to contain it. So um, we developed years ago a pillow tanks. Now, they were deemed to be disgusting at the time. But with the work that we've done in cleaning and reusing those, because again, there's another factor, is you, you've got to reuse the equipment that you put out and then turn it around very quickly and send it out again because it's otherwise un uneconomical. <coughs> so, so yes, cleaning and disinfection preparation is probably at least a third of our work before it even goes out on a truck. And then once it goes out on a truck, obviously it has to be delivered, it depends how far um, driver's hours are, 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 are a ridiculous containment with regard to the government. So you've got to have enough drivers, you have to have exchanges, there's always challenges on the festival site because you can't get people in because of the weather or, and all sorts of things like that. So, so a huge amount of planning. Is, massive and, and, amount of planning. And I, I suppose if, if you have, um, if you just go over, okay, we'll just give way more water than we can ever need. But then aside from the economic cost of that, of, well, then you're, you're paying for more units and more water than you need, there is also, I suppose, the environmental impact of them bringing all of that extra in. Well, it's more than that because there's laws. Right, so the laws are basically um, the water quality regulations. Um, there'll be laws about waste away scenarios and where they can go, where it can go. Um, but but let's just stick with the water side of things. Um, there there are some simple things, and you mentioned one. Uh, if you store too much water, that's wastage. Yeah, or it could be deemed as being misuse. And then if you steal it, that's called erroneous use or erroneous measurement, I think. So there are a number of key factors. Then you have um, another law that's engulfed within that, and that is the um, uh, RAS approval in the UK, but it's pretty much the same in, in anywhere else. Keyware is another one. But it's the materials that you use that won't contaminate the water that is storing. So the, 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 there are a number of rules that one has to keep to. Of course, you've got the inspectors. Um, and a few years ago, the public health inspectors were, and the environmental health officers were really uneducated as far as what they were looking for. And not so much now. And that's due to training and <coughs> due to a few standards that they can read and they, how they can pull it all together. But at the end of the day, they're a lot more aware and more engaged with the festivals. Um, and they like to flex their muscles, and they've yeah. got muscles, and they can close you down. Just, just quickly, if I, I come to Virginia, if, if I understand correctly from, from your introduction to, to the, the, the products and the technology that you're developing, would I be right in saying that if people were to move over to those sorts of toilets, for example, that, that would, could, have, could greatly reduce the amount of water that you need to bring on site? It will when it comes to um, vacuum flush, of course, um, and, and chemical research toilets, which, which both use water. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So that's um, what, an, another potential benefit of, of moving over to that. Yes. Yes. Um, let, let's come to Jane next, and in essence, ask the same question I asked Adrian, but but instead of getting water on site, in terms of dealing with the sewage that's coming through from all from those, how many toilets did you say you had on site? Five thousand. From the five thousand toilets. I, again, I suppose, what are the basic requirements that you have to deliver? Again, in terms of the law, in terms of inspectors, and what is best practice in going above and beyond? Well, I mean, I think the first thing is always providing enough toilets, you know, for your actual audience. So I think that's often, you know, sort of that's the benchmark, because otherwise your facilities are never, ever going to be achieving what they should be, because they're all going to be overfilling. And then, you know, you've got the knock-on effect of then if you haven't got enough transport to transport it off-site, if you haven't got enough tankers, if you haven't, it's like you're saying, it's about preparing. It, the main thing is preparing in advance for, the, you know, what you're going to need. Um, regards to taking waste off-site, I feel what we should be moving towards is closing the loop. We're already starting to do that compost toilets. 
Um, so now, you know, the hard waste from the toilets is composted down and with Glastonbury we bring some of that back to the site and the rest is spread on farms in local areas. <coughs> we still have to take away the urine off site, so that's still an issue which is something which I've, I feel should be looked at more to try and close that loop um, to stop, you know, stop that having to be a waste product. Um, so I think that is something that, you know, we could be moving more towards. You mentioned that, that the move to, to compost toilets at Glassbury, that was one of sort of the, the, the innovations that you helped oversee, and initially it was, uh, it seemed quite ambitious, but yeah. it's sort of increasing it every year. Um, I mean, just, I, I don't know how much you know about what's going on in, in the wider world beyond Glastonbury. But, I mean, are, are they becoming the norm at festivals or is it still quite innovative for, for Glastonbury to be having that approach? It's definitely becoming more normal, but it's becoming more normal within events that already lean that way. So, it so seems, events you in know, this room. <laughs> exactly. So people in this room, compost toilets aren't new, compost toilets aren't exciting, really. It's now the everyday norm. I, did, I was part of what took you know, compost toilets to Notting Hill Carnival, which was more of a step away from the normal crowd, you know, so they were, you know, not the normal festival goers and people were like, oh, it wouldn't, you know, that will never work, the streets of London, it did work, you know, and that's where I think we should be looking. It's great that, you know, festivals like in this room and events do take on compost toilets and alternative solutions, but I think the main aim is looking to the wider picture and getting it beyond, you know, preaching to the converted, you know, we need it to be the norm, you know, it's great that we're all doing it, but we have to show how good it is on a wider, you know, picture, wider scale. Do you think it makes a difference? Because obviously, what what one advantage that you guys have is, I mean, I know it's uh, that the, the festival goes beyond the actual Worthy Farm itself. But but you but the people who organise the festival also, in essence, own the site or have it. Yeah. Have, does does that make it easier to introduce these innovations? Yeah, massively. I mean, I am lucky. I mean, with Glastonbury, you're given so much free reign in not only with the land being yours, so you can implement new ideas you can you know dig down into the ground you can create pits you can there's so much more you can do but that shouldn't stop other events from still trying to look into you know other options i mean a lot of the work i'm doing is helping up and coming um companies sort of trial out systems so that they do become more usable on a wider scale you know they start small often with glastonbury and then you know through <coughs> trial and error they then can be more widely available Graham, you mentioned in the introduction that, that you um, work on a wide variety of festivals and, and sort of some field events and some more sort of city-based events and some big events and some smaller events. I mean, I suppose, you know, are, are the challenges different depending on the scale of the event and whether it's, it's a sort of a city-based event versus a field event? Um, yeah, I mean, definitely. The, I think and the, the demographic's really important as well. Um, if you take sort of contrasting, contrasting shows perhaps and, and look at the, the concerts in Hyde Park... Uh, we, you know, you've got people that are paying a lot of money for tickets. The um, it's sort of a high-end audience. The it's all flushing toilets. Although to be fair, all the public toilets are done off borehole water rather than mains water, which is um, from an underground reservoir under Hyde Park. But it's all going straight into mains drains as well. And we have got vac loos in there as well. So, in, there's a high expectation of of what what uh, the customer expects. But also, I think it, as that as a particular example. There's no tankering involved because there's mains water, there's mains, mains drains, back loos. So it, it achieves that high level of delivery with a sort of minimal impact. Uh, and then, but then you can flip to, to the Greenfields sites. And, and yeah, a lot, of toil a lot of the festivals had poor to loot polyjohns initially. Um, uh, I'm, I'm now moving and working with a lot more uh, festivals that are, are using the compostable um, option, but I think I think that's um, a really good option, and it, it, it works really well. But th there's more than just the once it's composted, it's fine. I think I think you touched on this. It's there's the whole it's the whole the journey of the poo. Like where's it going? How far has it been transported? And once it's been transported somewhere to be composted, is it staying there and being spread, or is it then going another four or five hundred miles? So I think. I yeah, think because, because the advantage of Glastonbury is it is a farm and it is surrounded by farms. So yeah. and there's a lot of people who would love that compost very nearby. Whereas I suppose if, if you are in a city, you, you've got to work out who's going to take this. Is it are they going to pay me for it? How am I going to get it there? Yeah. And all those well, extra logistics. I mean, that, I mean, even a lot of greenfield shows aren't aren't on their own land, so yeah. they, they just can't leave it there. And um, and there's also only two or three or, or four perhaps uh, of varying sizes compostable providers within within the country that that I know of. Only. Um, so I think I think there's 
is really is the way to go in terms of, of managing that. But the journey of the waste and how, how it's used and where it's taken is, is a really important part of that, I think. That the waste is is always a challenge. Transport's always costly. Puts the prices up for tickets, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, I suppose I mean I was stating the obvious almost, but by having the extra, if, if if it's ultimately an environmental aim here, every extra lorry that's going off is 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 sort of counteracting any absolutely. Any we all talk being. about ca carbon footprint, yeah. and you know, and and what. So uh, there are ways and means, as we, as you just alluded to, is as far as Hyde Park. You know, uh, when when I started to build on Hyde Park for Winter Wonderland, for instance, um, there was only three main drains. Now you can imagine three main drains dealing with that as a matter of throughput. Uh, what we had to do is be innovative as far as how we're going to collect it, as I've talked about containment. How we're then going to macerate it so it doesn't block up those three, four main drains, um, so that it comes becomes a slurry, and then how it can be disposed of. Um, uh, when we did the um, uh, the Olympics at, Hyde, uh, at uh, Horse Guards Parade for the, I was fortunate enough to be part of the, be the beach volleyball team, so I wasn't playing the game, <laughs> but uh, but nevertheless, um, you know, we were there and we had to make sure that we collected, you know, enough waste, um, enough water, and put it in the right places, otherwise we were going to be down the gallows into Tower of London, you know, so. <coughs> um, so it has to be thought about, but it, like I say, a greenfield site, maybe it'll only have one four-inch drain that feeds the farm. And then what the, the, but you've got 20,000 people to go down in there. So some of it's going to have to be taken away. We have got some innovation that's going on. Waste into water is one of them, whereas you can take a volume of water, sewage, um, and put it into a biodigester. Um, on site on site so all you do is bring one truck in um, and that truck then puts the machine on site you you have to then have some knowledge of bacteriological processes um, so we we, we we then cook up a recipe in an aerobic yeah so cook up your shit in a, <laughs> for three days in an aerobic capacity so basically it becomes gooey and nasty and then basically put more in and then that then wears over into a anaerobic aerobic so she's got anaerobic and then aerobic aerobic means you put bubbles in and you liven it up and you feed the bacteria fast um, and basically it grows and the way we've managed to do it is stratify that in a media and then they eat themselves and out the other end you get clean water scrub that and you scrub it up so you could potentially I have done this drunk out the other end I was ill for what? No, I didn't. <laughs> um, <coughs> well, you're still here. <laughs> but yeah, so um, so yes, of course you can. This is a technology that has grown, but it's taken us over five years. I suppose two quick questions there. on something like that, which is a: how long does the total process take place? Because I suppose some festivals have to get off site quite quickly. Correct. So it's three days to cook, then it's the festival, and then it's dependent on how much you've had to contain. <coughs> how much you take away and how much you keep it on site. So that's, a, that's an economical uh, economics question, really. But, but in effect, you can keep it going until you've used it all, if you could stay on site. And if not, and very often we've only got a, a limited amount of resources, so we want to be off to the next festival. But at least you've done something, you've done it environmentally. So you're talking about dealing with P. Um, well, this unit well, will do P quite easily. Yeah, so that's one way of turning it back, pull it to land. And so, as you're talking about putting, pulling out of a borehole, why not pull it out of the borehole where it is, clean it up and put it back on the ground so it replenishes the borehole? Mm -hmm. So that's the type of innovation one needs to look at, it's so that you have less containment but, and less transport. 
just want to come back back to Jay, and we obviously you mentioned the um, we talked about the expanding the use of compost toilets and and and, and the, the the benefit that that is bringing. I know there's some other things that you've been doing at Glastonbury. I don't know if you want to talk through through a couple of the other initiatives, more recent initiatives, and and what those are aiming to achieve, and sort of the the logistics of making those happen. Yeah, and no, I've been quite lucky to um, develop quite a good relationship with Bristol University, and with them, one of the first things I did with them was um, the pea power. So I got. Um, Bristol University to come with their unit, which we put up in a stone circle field, and what it did was it converted the urine into power. So we were powering light bulbs, we can power mobile phones, so it meant every time someone used the urinal, their urine was then converted into powering what was light in the urinal, which was quite a nice, you know, sort of loop. So w with them, we've slowly been, because they can gather data every time they do it at the festival, which means they can prove the unit each time. So last year we had them up by the pyramid stage, much bigger unit, much more urine going through, much more power being created. Um, we've also been, I've also been working with um, Bristol University, similar to yourself, um, doing like water treatment. So um, they've also been looking at how you can take, you know, with shower water out, you know, take all the shampoos and all the um, contaminants out of that. So like you say, it can be put straight back onto the ground. Um, and the same with grey water um, from the... Um, all the traders, so taking all the grease out. Um, I think it, I'm quite lucky to be able to trial all these um, innovative ideas because I think not only is it, you know, it is great for the event industry, but I do think it has such a knock-on effect for globally. You know, it's great that we can do it here, but it gives, uh, you know, <coughs> universities like Bristol a chance to actually trial their their systems on the ground which then makes a difference for when they do take it out, you know, to a refugee camp. You know, it's not the first time <coughs> they're actually trying it. They've actually tried it on a festival site like Glastonbury, which has quite a good, you know, amount of footfall. Well, let's come back to Virginia on that, because in your presentation, you talked about the work that you've done at, at, at festivals. You talked about the work you're doing in London and, of course, the work you're doing in Madagascar. How, how do those different projects all sort of link into each other? And what are, how, how d does the festival activity provide learning and testing that can then inform those other projects? Yeah, absolutely. Like, um, it's it's been a huge benefit to us um, in terms of throughput and sort of um, uses per day. You know, you get a lot more at a busy festival than you do in a household environment. So, um, by the time we sort of, I mean, I guess this past year when we sold equipment to the utility in Manila, that was kind of a big turning point for us. And and what was important about that was that not only that they knew that we had been running an operation in Madagascar that serves households, so that was a really important proof point for them but also that we have um, the same machinery that we were gonna be selling to them is also feeding an anaerobic digester operated by a UK utility. Um, also that UK customers at fancy events like Royal Windsor Horse Show like to use our toilets. And you know that's the kind of thing that for them, you know, it's really important um, that it's this kind of aspirational experience to, to use the toilet um, as well as the utility um, sort of being ready to buy into what we're doing and, and seeing it as, um, uh, you know, meeting all the standards that they have. You, you also said in your presentation that, that part of the challenge is, is wanting not just the decision makers, but people to use these, these, these services and, and getting people, sort of the people's support. Um, and you're mentioning there some of the events that, that have been using your toilets. I mean, in, obviously, sort of the, the, the cliche of the, the, the terrible toilet experience at the sort of classic field festival. I mean, w w those events that have been using your toilet, I mean, are they <coughs> seeing a, a good response? I suppose almost a customer experience more so than the environmental benefit. Or are we seeing people saying, actually, for a toilet at a big event like this, that is a much better experience? Yeah, it's, it's really interesting because it's really both. Um, and um, we're we've sort of, we came into this, you know, waste to energy is where we kind of started. Um, and at this stage, we talk about flush with happiness, which is like um, about kind of the joy of using a nice toilet. Um, it's all it's all happening is in terms of what we do, but in terms of what the events organizers who we work with value, it seems that environment is extremely important, um, sort of ease of operations and all these things, but customer experience is, is the number one thing that we hear about. Just pass back to, to, to Jane, I suppose, ask a, a similar question there for, from a Glastonbury perspective. Obviously, um, you're very passionate about improving it from an environmental perspective, and that obviously Glastonbury as an organization is, but is there also partly just trying to make it more pleasant for the Glastonbury goer, some of whom will be very much part of your ethos, but others will just want to have a more pleasant experience while on site? 
Yeah, I don't think it has to be two separate things. I think we don't need to take a step backwards for it to be sustainable. You know, um, I think it can be a good toilet and sustainable. We shouldn't look at it as like, oh, it may not please, you know, our public. It might not please our festival goers. You know, we should look at it as, you know, it's a good toilet and it happens to also be sustainable. And I suppose if we just back down the line, I suppose if those we, we said festivals in this room buy the sustainability thing, they buy the environmental thing, that's why they are interested. Maybe there are other festivals who aren't so uh, passionate about that or perhaps they're passionate about it but not to actually spend money on it. Do you think by saying, well, in addition to it being more sustainable, actually it just makes your site a more pleasant place to be, it may also be a way of getting more events on board? Yeah, I think rec recent um, innovations that have been brought in for the last 10, 15 years um, has increased the accessibility of festivals to other than those that just want to roll around in the mud. And the f my f one of the first festivals I went to was at Nebworth, and that was just a hole in the ground with a load of um, Hessian wrapping around, um, and, and absolutely a plank, a piece of scaffold board. Um, so, <coughs> but then I'm a lot older. Than that. <coughs> but um, yeah, so I think I, I think the key is, is is if you're going to improve standards you know, and health, safety and public health, you're going to keep to the rules, but otherwise you're going to get it shut down. So, you know, and people are prepared to pay and more festivals will be, uh, uh, are now wanting to, um, to take on different demographics, whereas before it was, you know, th their own standard type like people, um, but now it's going to expand. So obviously the, the festival industry then starts to bring in more people, music gets to more people, that's got to be a good thing. Um, so, yeah, we should keep innovating. Um, we should keep trying to improve ticket sales. We have a system where, you know, for dispensing water, but what we discovered is, is when we really were passionate about this, is, is that the more hydrated you are, the more you're going to enjoy your festival. And especially if you've got a young demographic, then they absolutely get, well, they get pissed. They get pissed and they go to sleep after the first night in their tents. And that causes a security problem and everything else a problem. But if you can keep them hydrated, they'll enjoy the festival, they'll enjoy the music that's coming back at them, they'll become, they come back the next year rather than the parents say, well, no, you're not Never going again. back there again. So th there's, there's a, got to be a wider thinking in regard to how we approach the sanitation, uh, water supply and toilet scenario. Just want to ask a quick last question of, of Graham, someone who works on a, a lot of different events. Um, I mean, are you, is, is across the board oblivious of the ethos and the size of the event? Uh, are this, is this a conversation that the, your clients, the organising promoters, are having? Are they open to the ideas of implementing some of the events that we've seen here today? Um, I think so. I mean, I think every promoter is very conscious that um, bad toilets equals bad reviews, and bad social media. So I think it's I think it's up there with everyone and they've all got different um, opinions on how it can work. And there's it, not everything that you have to do has to be financially motivated. I mean, the location of the toilets, the number of the toilets, the positioning and the planning in advance for not just for the proximity to campsites or to venues, but to for the servicing and to the tracks uh, to allow them to actually be to be maintained. Um, and I, th I think one of the other things that's really important is, is working with your suppliers um, and, and developing a relationship with them. And whether that's Polly John's or trailers or compost loose, whatever it might be. I mean, I think they're always open to feedback and, and working with you. And we've, we've been making developments with um, compostable um, companies um, and with PTL over the years and you know sometimes they listen sometimes they don't sometimes financially they can't change something but I think the more you work with folk especially as, as, as things improve and are changing a lot they are making new products uh, and if you can get in there and, and have that relationship with them then then they can incorporate some of your feedback and small things like the size of the the tap which is Ryan was in here something we made a really good point the other day that when you push, when you do the push tap, if, if the tap head's bigger than the bottle water, you get an immense amount of wastage, which is wet floor, it's taking the pressure out of the system. Yeah. And anno an annoyed punter. And an annoyed punter. And, and so there's lots of little things. I'm not saying a, a water mills can go and make all their taps quarter of an inch smaller, but you know, if, you, if when they're doing the next ones, if you let them know, then you know, maybe that changes. Yeah. Which I suppose brings us back to where we started, which is part of this is about uh, improving the customer experience, part of it is about making our events more sustainable, but also these festivals provide great 
experiment grounds where these new technologies can be tested and ideas can be sort of uh, put into practice that might then inform A, stuff at other events, but B, the, the infrastructure in our cities and in cities all over the world. Um, I promise that we take some questions, but I've run out of time. Uh, <laughs> oh, okay. Claire's saying we'll take one question. Okay, if, if there is... We started five minutes late, didn't we? So uh, we can eat another five minutes. Does anyone have any questions, as I did promise that we would take questions? Oh, look at that. Yeah. Look, there you go, sorted. <laughs> <laughs> oh, is there a question at the back? So you're, you're punting, but I can't see who that is. Oh, yes, I can see a hand there. Um, do you want to just shout? <laughs> no, I'm just uh, I've always been quite interested in the um, blue liquid in the chemical that's being used to make the glass. Yeah. And um, how does it break down, not being toxic? Is that too long a question? I have an answer to that, but maybe I'll let you go first because you're an expert. Okay, so formaldehyde was the original blue liquid. Um, and that's been outlawed. That's not allowed anymore. So, so it's so originally the answer was it didn't. <laughs> well, it didn't, but now now it's just a dye, a fragrant dye. So where does it go to the waste, and and then it's been dealt with much easier than it used to be. The dye just gets taken out through the process that the treatment works. It's just yeah. <laughs> But then you may be able to have something else to say about it. Well, I actually, I have different information. <clears throat> so um, I don't know. But um, because when, you know, we work a lot with the utilities in terms of our value proposition because um, the way that our machinery works is that we feed, we can feed waste directly into anaerobic digestion. And um, what I've understood is that um, formaldehyde has been mostly, mostly replaced by glutaraldehyde, which is an, another aldehyde biocide chemical and which um, requires aerobic treatment, um, which is quite energy intensive to break down. And it, it's, it's not environmentally friendly and it's also um, hazardous by EU standards, um, supposed to be banned in the EU by 2020. Um, and that's what you see in most um, chemical portable toilets. Just finally on that, there is, um, and I've forgotten the name of it, me and Chris were talking about it the other day, but there's a, there is a, a, a bio substance replacement now to blue, which is available, um, which, um, it's obviously better for the environment, but it's not quite as good at breaking down the poo or killing the smell. So that you got to got to take your make, yeah. your make your own choices there. Yeah. And, often it's, and often it doesn't have the same blue colour, which often when you know public are flushing, they have a problem with it. But if you put the message across yeah. that it is a better product for the environment, hopefully that will get through to people that it doesn't matter that what you can see when you flush the toilet. You know, the bigger picture is it's not as damaging. Yeah. Okay. Um, our, our time is up. We're going to go straight on to the next panel um, because sure. time is against us. So what I'm going to do is um, ask my next panellist to come up. But while that is happening, could we please have a round of applause for this brilliant panel here. <laughs> Back to life.